I V M. Hi, I am Satyajit. Hi, I am Racheta. Welcome to Paperback by the Open Library Project. We have as our guest today Rihana Munir. Rihana is the author of Paper Moon, which we discuss in the first half of the podcast. In the second half, we discuss various works by Susan Sontag, Adam Phillips, and Siddhartha Mukherjee. Happy listening. Welcome to Paperback by the Open Library Project. I am your co-host Satyajit, otherwise known as Onion Knight in most food circles. I'm hosting this podcast with my co-founder at the Open Library Project, Rajita Sharma. Hi guys, my name is Rajita. I'm an ex-banker, social impact entrepreneur, podcaster, writer, publisher, and inveterate learner. The Open Library Project is a curated library service which is offered to corporates on a subscription basis. The idea here is to create value, build a knowledge community, and encourage a growth mindset amongst our members. Today we have with us on the show Rehana Munir. Rehana ran a bookshop in Mumbai in the mid 2000s. a few years after graduating with top honors in english literature from st xavier's college an independent writer on culture and lifestyle she has a weekly humor column in ht brunch and a cinema column in arts illustrated magazine she is also an occasional copywriter rihana lives in bombay among food obsessed friends and family she is a local expert on migraines 1990s nostalgia and old monk and of course she is the author of paper moon the novel that's going to be released soon welcome to the show rehana thank you so much it's thank a pleasure to have you <laughs> it's a real pleasure to have you because you. Uh, racheta and i are both such lovers of books <laughs> so to meet someone who ran a bookshop that's like a dream for us yeah <laughs> and then got to writing so that's like that's like a great two career dreams trajectory coming true. <laughs> yeah <laughs> so tell us uh, rehana uh, how did you go from running a bookshop to then becoming a writer yes there were many uh, intervening years mm-hmm. and lots happened right um something that happened among things that happened was that i worked uh, with cricket websites okay <laughs> okay so i worked with bcci for a few years which is oh. one of those strange things right. or you know deviations that occur in life uh-huh. um those were fun years in their own way um apart from that i've been writing now for many years i've been an independent writer for mm-hmm. about 7 and um This last year and a half is when I actually got down to working on this book and uh, it's all set to be released now in a few days. Excellent. And um, so you know when you started the bookstore and the book also, you know, the book Paper Moon also talks about a bookstore. Um what is it actually do you know experience this whole um So, you know when you're a book lover and you're in the middle of millions of books it's always tough to decide which books you want to you know curate for your bookshop so what was the idea behind you know or some authors that you looked up to while you were setting up your bookstore yes so this actually what you just mentioned mm. finds place in the book itself because okay. <laughs> uh, the protagonist of the novel is someone called fiza khalid okay. and uh, she much like me uh, gets this opportunity to run a bookshop in bombay right. and uh, one of the first things you know when when it hits her that this is mm. actually happening yeah. uh, she finds herself in this dusty old warehouse mm. somewhere in old bombay mm. uh, okay. where all these books are stacked in iron racks right. mm. and she gets to pick right and uh, <laughs> like i've said in the book it's almost like alice in wonderland or you right. know eve in eden uh, where it's just pure magic yeah and uh, much like fiza i too went a little mad in those initial days because you tend to stock up with everything that you feel uh, that sort of is uh, uh, your sensibility and your favorites and things like that right so um but very soon you realize that uh, there's more to life <laughs> and to reading than yeah. your own personal favorites absolutely, absolutely. so uh, then you of course uh-huh. sort of get a feel for the market for the customers that you are uh, kind of catering to right. and uh, the books catalog the bookshops catalog expanded yeah. um so it very soon it stopped reflecting my own personal tastes <laughs> <laughs> 
and the market stays so yeah. like uh, yes there's some kind of a compromise right, yes, right, yes. Right. so then um, how did you find that differentiation from you know writing articles for ht to actually you know writing a book and because it is a longer process and it takes more time and effort so you know how did you get yourself motivated to do that or some tips you followed to you know actually yeah, achieve it you know this uh, question and i discuss this with friends mm-hmm. i'm almost embarrassed by how easy the transition was right. uh, <laughs> so as somebody who writes a uh, sh- shorter form right. um, uh, you know the the shorter form i've uh, I'm quite disciplined about it because if you get 700 or 1000 words or 1200 words for a column right. yeah. you tend to edit your thoughts right. and uh, you are not as expansive as you perhaps would sometimes like to be. Yeah. Uh, so the I, normal, in fact I feel it would be contrary to writing a book right because you yes. you're trying to sort of pressy everything Absolutely. and there you're trying to elaborate. Mm-hmm. So. Absolutely. Yeah. So there is that adjustment that you need to make but you know uh, for me the adjustments were all unconscious and mm-hmm. I think this whole book for all the similarities and the inspiration from real life mm-hmm. right. uh, kind of has come from a place it's almost like little elves wrote the book on my behalf <laughs> <laughs> and i wrote it I, i i read it as a reader rather than the author of it it was yeah. a very easy process um, i found it to be uh, fun and uh, kind of things just flowing seamlessly right. um, also i very early in the process i told myself don't overthink it because right. i yeah. am susceptible to that mm-hmm. uh, affliction <laughs> so okay. i said don't do this mm. just write um encouraged by a friend who's written a book himself mm. uh, he said you know and these are wise words i think for anyone who's listening and who wants to perhaps write fiction mm-hmm. yeah. of the longer form first finish your complete your first draft yes. right and then go back and do whatever and have as many drafts as you want but complete that first draft without going back too many times yeah. unless it is to uh, fix certain plot uh, issues plot changes okay and okay. i really stuck to that okay. so uh, but what i realized is the first draft was you know i quite liked it mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> so, right right <laughs> so, so then, you built on that and uh, came yeah, to the final so product. the second one was more of fine tuning and okay. uh, of course the publishers and then the editor right. came mm-hmm. in yeah So that was how it happened. That's great advice. Yeah. yeah. In uh, in the in our podcast, we often discuss the book uh, Bird by Bird, which mm. is about writing and yes. how to write. And uh, what it says in that book is writing writing is mostly about rewriting than about writing. Yeah. Yes. You get that first draft out, you're like yes. probably seventy eighty percent of the way there. Yes. Depending Absolutely. on how good the first draft is. So yeah. great advice for yeah. any writer. So tell us a little bit about uh, who would you think would the audience for Paper Moon be like uh, who should pick up this novel and what will they find in it Uh you know as a devious writer out to sell her book I want mm-hmm. to say everyone Definitely you <laughs> should <laughs> but I I can pick uh, smaller groups <laughs> too Um uh, it's very obviously a book meant for book lovers right, right. Uh, and book lovers you know again as soon as I started writing it the first thing I thought is oh god this book better not come out pretentious or arty or sort of it can't be all ob- obsessed about being all about high literary taste right. it was uh, i wanted it to be more personal mm. warm and yeah. inviting mm-hmm. and uh, the readership uh, therefore i feel can extend to anybody who has an interest in books has an interest in the city right. has an interest of course like all of us do most of us do in human relationships mm-hmm. right um family and friends and of course the romance question right. so i i would say that it is uh, uh, the readership should uh, extend to all these groups and uh, it it i hopefully doesn't scare anyone away by a bookshop on the cover <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> i find the cover to be very pretty but it's more of a warm inviting happy colorful it was very uh, bright kind of and scene. Uh, the cover is really bright and in- inviting like you said like yes. uh, it's really pleasant or falls nicely on the eye so uh, when thank you <laughs> when you mentioned uh, romance did you mean your romance with books or is there another factor to it Oh, all of it. So the book uh, Paper Moon is uh, a, a romance in a few ways. Okay. Uh, it's quite obviously uh, romancing Bombay yeah. <laughs> or a certain idea of Bombay. Right. Uh, I've set it in a well. It's a bit of a retro book, not too much. It mm. uh, begins in the late 1990s, and the the years that it covers are the uh, early years of the new millennium. Okay. okay. Um, so with that distance of around uh, almost two decades, I could give myself the liberty to talk about Bombay in a certain way. that right. i wouldn't right now yeah because right. we're all nostalgic about the past even right. if it is the recent past yeah um 
Also, Bombay has like the world changed so many times over in these last ten, twenty years. years. Yeah. Right. Social media is a very obvious uh, change. Yeah. That has kind of uh, completely uh, changed the whole dynamic. But um, yeah, so the romance uh, with the city, mm-hmm. uh, the romance uh, with books, uh, Fiza, the central character, right. uh, she represents that. And then the more literal romance uh, between. Uh, humans <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so there are a few romantic interests in the book that uh, are uh, interesting to me and hopefully to the reader great sounds fascinating yeah. and uh, when will the book be out uh, so uh, we're expecting it to be in stores any day now the okay. formal release is on the 17th of november okay. uh, pre orders have been open for a while now uh, one can get it online on flipkart amazon and uh, all stores big and small everywhere should be stocking it now super fantastic <laughs> fantastic so riana you mentioned that bombay is a big character in the book mm-hmm. so you were, you also have uh, been born and brought up in bombay yes. and uh, is the book sort of autobiographical in in a way because uh, even the uh, protagonist of the book owns a book show, books bookshop and you yes. used to also own a bookshop and how autobiographical is it is my question actually <laughs> <laughs> yes i think a clever way to dodge this question is if anyone sees something they like in it it's biographical if ah. they see what they don't like it's not <laughs> it's right. all made up it's a subjective opinion <laughs> <laughs> no, there there are some very obvious similarities uh, between the book, between the central character and uh, me, mm-hmm. and okay. there are very obvious deviations. Anybody who knows me, you know, for even a short while, will know mm-hmm. uh, the relationships that define my life are uh, completely absent from the book. Right. Uh, right. But yes, uh, there are uh, some very strong uh, similarities. There are interests that we share in common. The premise, of course, of a bookshop mm-hmm. yeah. uh, that that comes from my life. uh having said that uh, it was so much fun to develop these characters or to even discover i i felt i was discovering these characters myself mm-hmm. that yeah. were a hybrid of so many different people and feelings and thoughts that one has had and read over the years yeah uh so i sort of got over the whole fixation on reality versus fiction very early on And how did that feel like as a uh, non? You used to write non-fiction, right? Yeah, so writing shorter pieces, uh, hmm. which are uh, actually from Based life. Fact, huh? Yeah, right. uh, this was again just so liberating. It almost felt like you know a child with toys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That now I can do this. I can do this the way I want to. Yeah, uh, and and like you mentioned earlier, you know, it's like fulfilling the dreams that you. would have wanted to fulfill so yes uh, a lot of it if if you read the book hopefully you'll see that it is a happy uh, it leans towards light and laughter and hope and all of that uh, this is not necessarily exactly my world view mm, okay <laughs> <laughs> but okay. Uh, this is the form that the novel took okay, okay. Uh, and i didn't want to stop that or i didn't want to sort of uh, dict- kind of steer it this way or that In fact I thought it was steering me this way and that like. and uh, this is how it came out and I've stuck to it and are there some fantastic book recommendations mm-hmm. inside the book for your audience there are you know of, of course one of the pleasures and rewards of writing this book was I could talk about the writers I like right. so yes there are writers some of my old favorites are Iris Murdoch uh, Muriel Spark and the uh, Vikram Seth and oh, you know nice. some very uh, the usual name suspects right. yeah. <laughs> and there are others that come in which uh, hopefully readers will discover in the narrative brilliant that's that's like a double boon because you're like reading a book and then you get to know of which many other books others. Also <laughs> you can read <laughs> great <laughs> on that note we're going to take a short break and we'll be right back after this Hey everybody, welcome to another awesome week on the IVM Podcast Network. If you are not following us on social media, why the hell aren't you? It's about time that you did. We're IVM Podcast on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. We also got some really great news about Paisa Vesa. Anupam Gupta, our host, we couldn't be prouder of him. His show has won the award uh, for the best business podcast at the Asia Podcast Summit. Couldn't be happier, couldn't be prouder. Definitely check it out if you haven't heard it. It is an award-winning podcast now officially. I also would like to thank our sponsors this week, Storytel and Intel. Our sponsors make this possible, so please support our sponsors, tweet at them, tell them that you're happy that they're sponsoring the podcasting space. We're excited to announce our new show Storytellers and Story Sellers hosted by Vineet Kanabar. Every episode he talks to two guests, one from the creative side and one from the business side of the entertainment industry. This week Vineet is joined by executive creative director of TVF and storyteller Saurabh Khanna and chief strategy officer OML and story seller Tarun Tripathi. 
Together, they break down what goes into making a branded web series. Tune into new episodes every Thursday. On Cyrus Says, Cyrus is joined by Utsav Memoria. Utsav is the host of our new show and one of my favorites on the network, Postcards from Nowhere. He and Cyrus have a really interesting conversation about Utsav's fandom of Cyrus. Also, they talk a lot about, about travel and Utsav's recent marriage. On The Scene and the Unseen, Amit is joined by author Parvati Sharma. They talk about her book, Jahangir, an intimate portrait of a great Mughal. On Paisa Vesa this week, Anupam is joined by Amit Kumar Gupta, fund manager PMS Adroit Financial Services. He talks about financial services and the scuttlebutt method of stock research. The Habit Coach completes 150 episodes on Friday. Make sure you tune in to celebrate this milestone with Ashton as he talks about bravery and how to use it in your everyday life. On Simplified, Nadine and Shrika break down what behavioral addiction is and how someone suffering from it can be helped. On Golgappa, Tripti is joined by Manashi Soman. She is visually impaired who, despite these crippling odds, completed her secondary education and won the prestigious Balashri Award from President Abdul Kalam. On Feeding 10 Billion, Ramya and Varun are joined by Michelle Adelman, founder of GoFresh in Botswana. She is harnessing the power of technology with sustainable business models to find innovative solutions to food security in Africa. On Boundless, Natasha reads poetry about the struggles she faced as she entered her 30s and long-distance relationships. On The Origin of Things, Chuck narrates a fascinating story about an adventurous young man whose life revolved around music and road trips. And with that, let's get you on with your show. Welcome back, guys. We still have with us Rihanna Munir, author of Paper Moon, to be released soon and available on Amazon, Flipkart and all major bookstores. Hey, Rihanna. That Hello. Was, that, was a, that was a fantastic first half. Uh, yes, it was good fun. And a great are, insight into the book. <laughs> yeah, we are looking forward to the release. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, so in the second half, we are going to discuss a few of your favorite authors. So the first non-fiction author that we are talking about is Adam Phillips. So tell us, Rihanna, a little bit about uh, Adam Phillips' work and uh, why it kind of stands out for you. Yes, yeah, so Adam Phillips is a British uh, psychoanalyst and a literary essayist. Okay. And uh, both these fields of uh, thought mm-hmm. are of great interest to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, psychoanalysis has been interest for many years. Mm. Um, and I feel you need someone to mediate uh, some of the writings or all of the writings of Freud and the rest. Right. <laughs> so Adam so Phillips true. does such, yeah. yes, I, I've been lost, you know, in mm-hmm. the writings. And I, I, I felt that I could tackle a book after having studied literature and a yeah. master's in this and that. But no, yeah. you feel terribly inadequate. Okay. So uh, what Adam Phillips does is he takes a lot of these uh, uh, thoughts and streams of uh, uh, psychology and mm-hmm. psychoanalysis and he puts them into a great format, which is the literary essay. Okay. okay. Uh, so example and the essays would not be very from obscure sources. Mm-hmm. So these Shakespeare Shakespearean plays which everyone knows about even yeah. if they haven't read them. Mm-hmm. You know right. what Hamlet's problem was yeah. or what yeah. Othello suffered with, yeah. you know right. from. So uh, he uses these allusions and uh, in a very again not in an intimidating way, mm-hmm. in a way to elucidate the point. Yeah. And uh, so, so many collections. One of the one of which I remember is uh, something called "Missing Out," okay. yeah. in which he talks about this whole phenomenon. We call it FOMO, right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in a more literary way, he talks about these lives that we feel we could have lived yeah. instead of, the, of our lives. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. And uh, what does that mean? Mm-hmm. How does that intersect? How do those lives intersect with the ones that we actually do live? Yeah. So you know, they're very simple but uh, very insightful, uh, very beautifully written and to me uh, what I find interesting and very uh, enriching about reading this particular writer is that if anyone has ever had an experience of psychotherapy Mm -hmm. seen a therapist of any uh, sort which I had for a short while many years ago you feel actually you are in a session of a sort okay okay. (laughs) which I find to be fascinating when you end an essay it's almost as if you have been sitting comfortably in a couch you know with a cup of coffee and uh, it's of course different from the analytical experience in that here he's talking and not you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh, right. it's I, I would highly recommend it to anyone who is uh, interested in uh, that kind of thought and that kind of exploration. This is really cool because, yeah. uh, you know, a lot of the times we miss out on a lot of important information just because in the way it's presented to yes, us. Yes. Uh, I feel like what maybe Mr. So Phillips... Mediators, yeah. Yeah, what yeah. Mr. Phillips is doing with uh, psychoanalysis yes. of maybe Freud and all yes. that is 
so necessary for our world because like Absolutely. we aren't going to read those papers yes. that Freud wrote or probably won't understand what he meant to, in a lot of the that's context. more likely yeah. <laughs> and without being simplistic you know right. what yeah. we tend to do is make everything psychology 101 and right. pop right. this right. and pop that mm-hmm. but this is sort of uh, actually deep and meaningful without being intimidating or pretentious and uh, that to me those are very great qualities for any writing in general yeah and so uh, you spoke about missing out and uh, yes. you know does the book talk about you know how to deal with fomo or is it just <laughs> you know a more positive approach to you know sort of maybe making that a goal for your life and then working towards it or? you know it's one of many essays in the collection okay. uh, uh, one of his uh, the point he's trying to make uh, perhaps is uh, how that unlived life is uh, necessary for us in some ways to uh, have a coherent picture of the life we have basically everything stands in uh, con- not just in contrast but in mm. relationship to everything else yeah right. uh, so again uh, i would do a very bad job of summarizing it mm-hmm. right. because uh, that is the point of the essay to do mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. but uh, for anyone listening uh, please uh, uh, get that essay and that collection because it's uh, difficult to summarize a writer like adam phillips right. uh, since the thrust of his argument and his uh, manner of delivering it mm. is so beautiful and so poetic that it's more than just the point he's making you know it yeah. is also how he's making it you've pretty much convinced me <laughs> <laughs> you know let's go and check out this essay yeah. right yeah and so the next writer that we're moving on to is susan sontag Right. Yes. Tell us a little bit about uh, Susan Sontag's yes, work and yes. uh, why it has impacted you. Yes. So she's pretty much my idea of a renaissance woman. Okay. Uh, and uh, she was one of known at her peak or is even now as perhaps the most intelligent woman in America. <laughs> These are very specious claims right. and arguments. But no, she's a, of course, she's not around anymore. But she was a writer, philosopher and activist. Many, many, many things. Right. Uh, what I really um, uh, admire her for and and the book or the collection that I find to be uh, closest to my heart is mm. uh, something that she wrote. It's called Illness as Metaphor. If I'm not mistaken, it came out in 1978. Okay. Okay. And in that, she talks about how we use metaphors for illnesses like cancer mm-hmm. and right. tuberculosis, uh, mm. TB before cancer. Mm. And she herself was suffering from breast cancer, I think, after which she wrote this book or on the basis of which she wrote it and she talks about all the the culture of uh, victim blaming or mm. the, the the sufferer is made to feel that you have a cancer personality mm. and cancer right. arises out of certain suppressions okay. and uh, if you were a person who kind of gave vent to these feelings you would you wouldn't maybe not yes, and yeah. she points that out and calls it out as being very very dangerous because that person should perhaps be seeking treatment <laughs> right yeah. and yeah. not indulging in self blame yeah. yeah and you know it is so common i've i've only ever lived in india so mm-hmm. i don't want to say oh, it happens in india only perhaps it happens everywhere where uh, in families and social circles you know you think too much or you do this too much and yeah no and which which perhaps which could uh, is a seg into the next writer that we right. can talk about right. who writes this book called the emperor of all uh, maladies, maladies. Yeah. siddhartha, siddhartha mukherjee yeah. yeah so there is a kind of a, you know Link connection yeah. there that book again and i think he cites susan sontag's book in a few places okay uh, where the whole culture again of victim blaming or the, su- the, the sufferer being responsible mm-hmm. yeah. he completely calls it out and that book i feel is so empowering it's about cancer yeah and yet it makes you feel like a lot of things have to actually go wrong for someone to uh, get cancer right. right right so different from how we feel up you know you open the microwave door and you might get you know yeah. this cancer rays and that is cancer mm-hmm. you know you read a book like that and you realize and more than even the book there's an interview that's published in the edition that i have mm-hmm. okay where uh, the interview asks siddharth mukherjee mm. uh as an on- as an oncologist mm. and a physician as someone who's thought and lived uh, you know worked in the area of cancer for so many right. years what would be your advice to anyone in terms of cancer prevention and he said mm. i have five things to say mm. Mm. don't smoke don't smoke don't smoke don't smoke don't smoke yeah. like conclusively that is the only thing that we have so far right, right. and yet there is this whole mythology around it and uh, self blame and shaming and yeah. you know so many products that come up so i find these books to be yeah. inspiring and and 
as literature they work <laughs> they are right. all non fiction but they are written with such imaginative clarity right. and uh, it's just wonderful to read some of the yeah. best non fiction books are in narrative or storytelling form you know that's what i found yes absolutely mm-hmm. siddharth mukherjee's next book the gene also mm-hmm. oh my uh, he's talking about the gene and it's a uh, thrill it's a page turn i was just going to come to that you know yes. like you know a lot of breast cancer cases yes. are genetic because you know yes. you are more likely to get it because yes. of your ancestors yes. so yeah yeah gene would be an interesting uh, yeah there are great sequel to yes. this so yeah look forward to that one as well and uh, so rayana tell us a little bit about your own personal uh, you know inspirations not just fiction maybe so not just non fiction maybe mm-hmm. some fiction authors as well since you have written this novel and uh, yes. we'd love to know who inspired you and who and you who are. you feel closest to in terms of writing <laughs> oh wow <laughs> i have to answer that without sounding vain <laughs> <laughs> That's the challenge. <laughs> I would say Shakespeare. <laughs> uh, We no. can take that. One. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, seriously speaking, I have uh, the book begins with a dedication to uh, my professor, someone who taught me English literature at Saint Xavier's. She's a poet and professor called Eunice de Souza. Okay. So I would say that she is uh, not just an inspiration. She sort of taught me and so many of her other students to look at the world in a certain way, right. and that of course. Uh, Uh, changes you as mm-hmm. a reader and then later as a writer yeah. so i think she i would rate as a very high on that list um so a recent discovery of mine is a writer called barbara pym she's a, a pym is p y m hmm. she's a british novelist uh, her books are set post world war 2 in uh, england and uh, again this was said of jane austen before her yeah. <laughs> that mm-hmm. you write uh, about people and in a setting that is uh, in inverted commas small mm-hmm. small in terms of it's, it's not about wars mm. and it's not about some you know mm. universal in in that sense uh, large scale yeah. uh, issues and yet you are uh, uh, talking in minute detail about everyday life with such uh, again insight and clarity and uh, uh, flair Yeah. So I feel reading Barbara Pym the last few years um uh, encouraged me uh and made me more confident about writing fiction that is not necessarily out to compete with either a Tolstoy or a Virginia Woolf. Right. Yeah. You know who are in their own yeah. ways revolutionary. Right. And so big. And so the 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 bigness of the enterprise was really daunting for me for many years. But then you read someone like her and you say in your own way you can write a page and a chapter and maybe a book yeah. that uh, yeah. is still significant uh, despite talking about things that are uh, about everyday and routine matters right. and, uh, in fact that's very very important yeah. to you know choose uh, a genre that you feel you can add value to as opposed to being like you know I should be writing about something intelligent my book yes. should sound smart and Yes absolutely yes yes that's yeah. a trap that one can easily fall into and uh, right. thankfully uh, uh, that didn't uh, come into play while I was writing uh, it it was it was first and foremost about writing something that I would enjoy reading yeah, yeah. Uh, exactly which yeah. is a cliche yeah. but it's so true you yeah. know you write what you like exactly and there will be someone out there who's interested in it absolutely definitely Yeah. And so Rayana where can uh, people find you online are you on social media are you uh... Yes I am the uh, reluctant uh, social mediaist <laughs> <laughs> I have been on Facebook for many years but right. it's more of a closed group kind of thing okay. I am now uh, on uh, Instagram and I'm finding my way there uh, okay. but I am there I'm also on Twitter I have been uh, for a few years now um, okay. trying to be more savvy and uh, engaging more So yes. So it is a uh, Rihanna underscore Munir on Instagram. Yeah, right? and I think that's a double underscore. It's a longer underscore okay. than okay. the usual, but yeah. Okay. Rihanna cool. Munir. So for our listeners, if you want to reach out to Rihanna, you can on Instagram on Rihanna double underscore Munir. <laughs> yes. And uh, we look forward to the launch of your book. Uh, Thank you so much. We Thank will you. definitely be reading it, and uh, we'll share our thoughts with you. That's great that's to fun. hear, and Thank all the very best. <coughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. And a big thank you to all our listeners. You can follow the Open Library project on LinkedIn, Instagram and Facebook for latest updates on our events and stay tuned for the next paperback podcast on IVM Podcasts. Happy reading. You can follow IVM Podcasts on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter at IVM Podcasts. Listen to paperback on the IVM Podcasts app, website or wherever you listen to podcasts. Mm-hmm. 
माणसं गोल गप्प्यासारखी असतात हाय हॅलो करताना वेगळी आणि बोलताना वेगळी आणि गप्पा मारताना वेगळी मित्र झाली की वेगळी आणि शत्रू म्हणून वेगळी थोडक्यात दिसणारी वेगळी आणि असणारी वेगळी कधी आंबट कधी गोड कधी तिखट तर कधी चमचमीत आणि कधी कधी हॉट अँड स्पायसी सुद्धा आणि म्हणूनच गप्पा सॉरी सॉरी गोल गप्पा विथ तृप्ती खामकर फक्त तुमच्यासाठी दर बुधवारी आय व्ही एम पॉडकास्ट च्या ऍप वर वेबसाईट वर किंवा युट्यूब चॅनल वर सुद्धा ऐकू शकता तुम्ही आमचा पॉडकास्ट वेगवेगळ्या पॉडकास्ट प्लॅटफॉर्म वरती ऐकू शकता फक्त सर्च करा गोल गप्पा विथ तृप्ती खामकर आणि आमचा पॉडकास्ट ऐकत राहा Advertising is dead. Yep, you heard me right. Advertising is dead. We're all in the content business now. Let's not call it news, TV, radio, etc., etc. It's all content and we're in the middle of this weirdly exciting phase where all the borders and lines that have been drawn over decades has been swept away by this lovely thing called the internet. We're a show where we don't dwell on just the stuff that is now, but rather the wider stuff about advertising, media, content and the whole goddamn circus surrounding it. Tune in every Tuesday for our weekly unboxing of the mystery box we used to call advertising. I'm Varun Dugirala, co-founder and content chief at The Glitch, and this is my new podcast, Advertising is Dead. Advertising is Dead.